Hi, this is Steve Andres. I'm the pastor of New City Church, and this is our podcast. Every week at New City, we invite people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and learn how to make a difference. I want to thank you for joining us today, and I hope that this message inspires and challenges you to love God and serve your city more. If you want more info on New City Church or other resources, go to newcity.life today. But for now, enjoy this message. Christmas time, I find it curi- I was kind of finding it curious as I was thinking about this. Um, just like we, we are always trying to put on like there's this tremendous amount of weight pressure that we feel to like make special moments, right? And so even at church we do that. We're like, let's make it special. And uh, and at home, you know, with our family, we're like, we got to make it special. And you're like, this is the best time of year. We have to make it awesome, right? And we're all angry and uh, sweaty and, you know, whatever. Um, wrapping gifts, you know, and who likes to wrap gifts here? This is awful. I don't trust you at all. It just has to be one of the worst things um, to do. Um, and, and so, you know, we're angry as we're wrapping the gifts. And I, let me just say, we, it is really wonderful to want to create a moment. But the most important thing for us today, speaking to you and speaking to me, the most important thing for us today is to be reminded of what God is speaking to us when he sent his one and only son. To be reminded of what that message is and what that word is like the Apostle John talked about it, that word that God spoke again at Bethlehem, to be reminded of that and to listen carefully to it. So we've talked about that the past few weeks. We're going to talk about it one more time today. And uh, I'm just going to encourage you to maybe do that again. Just press pause on all the other stuff and say, God, the most important thing for me today is to hear from you. So here is our text from Matthew chapter 2. It's the same text as last week. It's a familiar one to most of us. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied. And then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Let's pray together. Father, We come to you one more time today and ask you to speak to our hearts. We ask in these moments that you would focus our vision, focus our attention on what you would be saying to us today. We don't just want to be listening to it, God. We want to hear it as well. And so we quiet our hearts, we humble our hearts, and we invite you, Lord, in these moments into our lives, into our story, into our mess. We pray, God, that you would minister, encourage, build up, lean on, the, on us in the, in the direction that you want us to go today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Greet somebody one more time before you're seated today, and then we'll carry on. Last week, we talked about these men. We talked about the gifts that they were bringing, and we um, really had an incredible uh, week last week. And so I want to express my appreciation to you. Um, 
we had a, a wonderful response to our Vision 2020 offering. And man, I'm just grateful for it because I really believe, as we talked about last week, those gifts that we bring, God already is preparing them for the work that he wants to accomplish through them. And so thank you for being a part of that. And, and, uh, and I wanted to circle back around to this text this week because there's more to be said about it. These guys are really fascinating characters to me because the magi, or the wise men as they're sometimes called, scholars, scientists, wealthy men from a different part of the world were never really given any specifics other than that they came from the east. They traveled hundreds or maybe even thousands of miles on a journey to find the meaning behind the star that they saw in the sky. And they're a little out of place in this story because all the other characters are, are very provincial, right? They're from this very small town. They're from a, a specific group of people um, that, that, that have a long history with the God of, that, that we know, the God from the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had this long history with him. But then in the middle of this story, occupying almost a whole chapter of the narrative from Matthew's biography of Jesus are these guys from out of nowhere, Right? They would otherwise, you know, seem to be far from God's purposes, but it's pretty amazing that they're included in this story because they don't have the scriptures, uh, the Old Testament scriptures like the rest of the characters in the story would have had, right? They, they, they didn't know any Hillsong songs, okay? Somebody, somebody said this week uh, that they wanted to start a Hillsong cover band, and I said, you know what? I think we already qualify as a Hillsong cover band. Um, they never read an Andy Stanley book. They never posted a, pic, a picture of their coffee next to an open Bible with a caption saying, got to have Java and Jesus in my morning to start. Thank God they didn't do that, right? They never did any of that stuff, but God is speaking to them, which I find amazing. And, and I, I hope to show today that that's not even uncommon. What's uncommon, I think, perhaps about this part of the story is that these wise men listen to what God is saying to them. Are you listening today to what God is saying to you? The other day I was in the kitchen eating something, and Jessie was all the way in our family room, and she yelled at me to stop chewing so loud. <laughs> She's looking at me right now like. <laughs> so if somebody yelling at you from another room to stop chewing so loud sounds good to you, marriage is probably for you. Because I think when women get married, they get like superhuman hearing. And it's amazing to me that she could hear what I, she was listening to what I'm doing all the way over here. So here's the thing. There's a few points I want to share with you today. And here's the first one. Pay attention. Because God is already speaking to you. He's already speaking to you. The miracle that we celebrate in this season is, that, is, is this moment when God stripped away all the finery and all the titles of honor and arrived dressed in nothing more than his birthday suit. I said that to, <laughs> I asked Ava this week, do you know what your birthday suit is? And she was like, What? I said, it's what you were wearing when you were born. She, I said, I said this, you weren't wearing anything. She goes, no, I was wearing a bathing suit. <laughs> it's like, it's really interesting that you remember. That God would leave all that behind to speak in a language that you and I would understand, the language that we understand best, skin and bones. A.W. Tozer, a Chicago pastor from many years ago, he called God the eternally speaking God because since God first spoke the universe into glorious being, the Bible is telling us that he, the, the echoes of that speech have continued even to this day. Here's what Paul says, the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 1. He says, the basic reality of God is plain enough. Open your eyes, and there it is. By taking a long and thoughtful look at what God has created, people have always been able to see what their eyes as such can't see. Eternal power, for instance, and the mystery of his divine being. So nobody has an excuse. You can tell sometimes what speaks to people the most, right? Because we, we kind of rep whatever we think speaks to us. People who love the outdoors, they love, how many guys love the outdoors? They love to rep their passion, right? They wear hiking boots in the winter and Tiva sandals in the summertime. And 
You know, what's this shirt? What, what, what? Oh, I like that shirt. What are you wearing? Oh, this, this is just my base layer. What, your what? It's my base layer. They love the outdoors, and so they always want to dress in outdoorsy stuff as if somehow in Chicago there's just going to be like an impromptu hike that's going to break out at some moment, and they're going <laughs> to get to hiking. If they love, some, some people, music speaks to them. And to the musician, God speaks, I think, in rhythm and melody. To the artist, he speaks in color and form. To the child, he speaks in laughter and warmth. To people in love, he speaks in tenderness and in giving. To magi, he speaks star. You didn't know that God spoke star, but he does. <laughs> Why not? Because God speaks every other language that has been invented, every other language that has communicated to the human heart, God speaks in that language. One favorite scholar of mine, an African scholar named Laman Senna, he, he, he speaks about, he writes about how Christianity was revolutionary because wherever it was, wherever it spread, and it reached Africa a long time before it reached Europe, FYI, it was communicated in whatever local languages were spoken. There is no sacred language in Christianity, no preferred cultural expression in Christianity because the Bible says that God speaks in every language and is speaking even now in all of the languages that you and I speak and then everything else that would speak to our hearts. The Bible says that the whole earth is the Lord's and everyone in it. There are no exceptions, we say, to God's exceptional love. No exceptions. The whole earth is the Lord's, and everyone in it belongs to him. Christianity does not erase distinctives of culture or language. Just kind of maybe taking a little bit of rabbit trail here because I, when I was preparing, I thought, you know, I just want to say this. <laughs> it actually invests in those distinctives. It redeems those cultural expressions. That's why the apostle, when the apostle John caught a glimpse of heaven, he, he, he saw a huge group of people, and it didn't say, and they were all just one group of people saying in one language with one voice, praising God. He says this. It says that he saw people from every tribe and nation and language. They were all there with their distinctives, diverse in all of their expressions of worship to God, but they were there unified in love to the creator. And he says there, he said, I almost fell on my face because I had to fall on my face because I couldn't believe the worship. He got knocked down by the worship of all those people. So nobody gets excluded from God's exceptional love. Jesus himself made a ministry out of welcoming people who had, man, they had been disqualified from God's love. And they were treated by others as if they were disqualified. But Jesus treated them like they were family. He was in the habit of disregarding those boundaries, those labels of who is in and who is out. That was the way Jesus operated. That's why I think these magi make sense. There was nobody there at the beginning of this story to tell the magi that they didn't belong, <laughs> right? God went to great lengths, as a matter of fact, changing the complexion of the night sky so that they would be the ones who would be able to meet the Savior. Think about that. He sends a sign in the heavens so these guys who are thousands of miles away would set out on their journey and actually find their way to the Christ. You might feel a thousand miles away from God today. But don't for one second believe that you are counted out or that you are disqualified from God's love. Let me, just be, let me just be sure that you know that today. God loves everyone, those on the outside, those who think they're on the inside. Pay attention, I would say, because God is actually speaking to you. Number two, don't get stuck somewhere that God has called you to leave. Don't get stuck somewhere that God has called you to leave. I imagine that when they saw that star appear in the sky that those men must have had some questions. Where is this journey going to go? How long is this going to take us? How long is it going to last? And what is the end of this whole thing? But they did not wait to have all of their questions answered before they actually stepped out and left where they were to seek after what God was speaking to them. Now, for those of you guys who haven't known this, I, I've recently become a vegetarian, a vegan actually, not a strict one, though, because I still eat beef and pork and fish and chicken. But I eat vegetables, too, right? 
which makes no sense. <laughs> Because the whole point, by the way, I'm not, the whole point of, of making that leap to veganness, right, vegan goodness, whatever it is, the whole point is that you step away from that other stuff to embrace this lifestyle. It's not possible to do both. If you want to follow Jesus in faith, I want, to, I want you to know today, you're going to probably have to step out of the comfort that you are in right now, maybe even the comfort of your dysfunction. Maybe even the comfort of the stuff that has, has been normal for you. But when God makes that start, when God calls to you and bids your heart closer to him, then you're going to have to step away from some stuff to be able to seek after him. That's just the nature of it. You cannot stay where you are. And so I'm saying don't get stuck somewhere if God is calling you out of it. What are you waiting on today to trust God completely? What's keeping you from being able to pursue him today? I, I just, the, the life of pursuit of God is never one of certainty. It's one of trust and hope. We don't get certain answers to our questions. These guys, when, the, when that star appeared in the sky, they did not know where this journey was going to end. But I think it's amazing and admirable that they stepped out in faith and in hope. Don't get stuck in something that God has called you out of. If you make a decision to pursue God, and I, I think it's wonderful this year, we've seen hundreds of people make decisions to, for Christ, and I think that is worth celebrating, 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 celebrating. I, I just, that I love. But if you have made a decision to do that, then it is going to mean leaving some things behind in order to follow him. But here's the good news. When you pursue God, God will help you to avoid a thousand or a, a, a ten thousand unseen traps and forsake a hundred lesser loves. That's what I think happens. When you pursue him, you will find yourself navigating it. This, this is what happened to the Magi. I mean, they were, in a, they were in a precarious place. They did not know it, that Herod wanted. Herod would have had that child dead. Herod would have had them had they tried to defend it, that child. He would, they were in a very dangerous place, but God walked them right through it because they were pursuing him. Whatever it is that is keeping you, it might be habits of thinking that have become so much a part of who we are that, that we're threatened sometimes. We feel almost insecure when those things are threatened. And when God calls us to leave those things, we sometimes feel like, I can't leave that behind. It's too comfortable. A lot of people are like Eve, and they're negotiating with something that they should be stepping on. <laughs> right? The serpent comes to Eve and starts talking to her. And here she is, like, kind of carrying on a conversation. I think some people I've noticed over time, they will spend time talking and talking and negotiating with these. When it really, they ought to just step on it and move on. <laughs> Whatever it is, if it's a cynical, negative attitude that doesn't come from faith and trust in God, if it's worry, if it's shame that somebody put on you, whatever it is, time to step on it and walk away. Say goodbye. And pursue God. God will help you with the rest. Number three, don't make the trip alone. The Magi, they rolled into town with their whole squad. Who knows? Who knows what it looked like? But it had to be quite a sight to see. Ava, not long ago, came into my room. It was, I think, about 4.45 a.m., and for those of you who have had or have little kids, this is, this is a, you know, the way it is. They walk in. She, she has long hair, long dark hair, so she looks like the girl from the ring. Uh, it's just like in her eyes. She says nothing. I can, just, I, just, I can sense her presence next to me and then her hot breath on my face. <laughs> and my eyes will open up, and then she just was standing there looking at me like this, and she goes, let's play tag. It's terrifying. It's really sc scary. But I'm, like, I'm amazed. Like, she is ready to go when she wakes up. It's like, let's get. I, I don't know um, what it took to get these guys to leave where they were and how quickly they got moving or, or who the ringleader was of all them. But it's important to note that, that no matter whether there was one who was reluctant or one who was ready to go, uh, that they all, they all walked together. They made the journey together. And I think our model here, and I think what the Bible teaches us is that we are, there's no kind of like one man show. There's no, there's no one woman show in Christianity. We are called to walk together in relationship. And that means
means it gets a little bit messy when we make the journey together. We say it like this, and you've heard it already, but we say we invite everybody to, to, to know God, to find freedom, to discover purpose, and to make a difference. But what we, what we aren't saying every time we mention this is we want you to do that together. You can't do this alone. These guys made the journey with the whole squad together. And I love what I see happening week in and week out at New City Church. People are bringing friends and neighbors and family to church, inviting others to come along with them, and walking with people and encouraging them. Hebrews 3.13 says, encourage one another daily while it's still called today so that none of you would be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. I love that. Because if we aren't careful, we've got blind spots. And if we aren't relying on other people to encourage us, and if we aren't encouraging one another, we're going to find ourselves at times, our hearts will grow hard, meaning we won't hear what God is saying, or we won't be able to see where we need to go. And, 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 and the problem is with that, that when our hearts get hard, now all of a sudden we, get, we start wandering off into all kinds of uncharted territory, away from where God is calling us to be told this story before, but it's one of my favorites. He was one of the greats in sports history, Muhammad Ali. And he was as famous for his accomplishments as an athlete as he was for his persona, right? He was bombastic in everything that he said. And so he, you know, the story is that he was on a plane one day and um, the flight attendant came up to him and said, sir, I'm, I'm going to need you to put on your seatbelt. And he always liked to call himself Superman, right? So he was like, hey, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And the flight attendant responded real quick, well, Superman don't need a plane either, so put your seatbelt on. <laughs> there, 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 this, this is the point. There are no supermen and there are no superwomen when it comes to following Christ. We need one another. You could put the title of pastor, elder, apostle, prophet, bishop, you name it, whatever, whatever kind of high and holy title you want to assign to somebody, and I promise you they are the same as everybody else with feet of clay. They need and we need one another. That journey from knowing God to finding freedom, discovering purpose, make it, that all happens when we trust one another. It happens through relationship. And, and I, I will say this until I am blue in the face. I've learned that I just got to repeat myself over and over again. It is relationships, not sermons, not songs that change lives. Because I know that you can think probably of one or two, maybe one, maybe some, maybe you remember a sermon or two from your entire life, but I can promise you that you could name the five people who've had the deepest impact on you. That is the way, that's the program and the pattern for God, that God has given to us for life change, to be in relationship with one another and to shape one another. In January, we're going to start what we're calling freedom groups. Now, I love the fact that I've said this enough that people are now getting irritated. What are freedom groups, okay? And I've realized that I, as I've kind of talked with some folks about it, I need to explain it very simply like this. Freedom groups are like every other small group that we run, okay? They're just small groups, but they have a specific curriculum. They have a specific program that we're following together. So we're pressing pause on all of our other small groups, and we're all going to walk, as many as we can get, to walk together on, on this, on this eight-week journey to say we want to actually understand who God has said that we are. We want to understand who God is, what the Bible says about our identity in Christ, and we want to step into that and walk that out. So that's what the freedom group thing is. It's just, it's a small group. But it's, it's everybody on the same page. Because normally when we run small groups here, we, we, we let it, you know, you could do, a, you could do a, a Bible study on 1 Corinthians or you could be over here doing a, a dinner group with this kind of stuff and, and you could meet uh, and have a workout group here and all these different options. But for, for eight weeks, we're going to say we want everybody on board with the same, moving in the same direction. So I'm inviting you, really, I'm inviting you to be a part of this. We're going to tell you more about it. There's actually going to be an informational meeting on January 5th for people who might want to facilitate uh, and host a group. Uh, but, but basically, it's just helping us to understand who we are in Christ. Or maybe I actually like to say it like this. It's learning how to stand under who we are in Christ. It's one thing to understand. It's another thing to stand under it. So if 
if this is something for you, then we, we say it every week, and this is not a commercial, but because I'm talking about it, if you want to know, if you want updates on this, just text FREEDOM to our, our text number, 312-313-2729. That's what we always do. The Magi, they made their journey together. Number four and last point. Don't stop at the star. Though they were outsiders, though they were strangers to God's people, what these magi knew, they knew star. They knew stars. And they loved stars. So we would say, hey, they don't have a Bible. They don't have anybody. They don't have the Christian radio. They don't have anything. How, does, how is God going to speak to these guys who don't know any of that stuff? Well, he's going to speak to them in the language that they do know and that they love, and he's going to speak star to them. And that is exactly what God did. And thankfully, God speaks star very fluently. But what was special wasn't just that these guys saw the star and that they followed the star. Was what was special about them was that they didn't stop at the star. Right? Because if they had simply seen the star in the night sky and bowed down and worshipped the star, where would we be today? They wouldn't be a part of the story. They didn't stop at the star. They realized that this thing that they loved and this thing that, they, that captivated their hearts was actually supposed to draw them even further beyond that thing itself to the person behind it. They realized that this gift was pointing them to something better, to someone better. And so they made the long journey to the presence of the Christ child and they worshiped him and they gave thanks to him. So don't stop at the star today. Does God speak star? Yeah, we've covered that. Does he speak friend? Yep, very well. Does he speak physics? Absolutely. Biology? Yes. Mountaintop vistas, he speaks it really well. He speaks all of these things. Whatever it is that has moved your heart, whatever it is that you find beautiful and good in the world as we see it, let me tell you, if you were to bow down and worship that thing, even if it's a spouse or all the good things that God has given to you in your life, your children, your, 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 your comfort, the security, whatever it might be, the beauty that you love in music, if you worship that, then you've missed the point. The point is to go beyond that to the one who gave you those good things and to worship him. Those stars are meant to guide us to the true light. So don't stop at the star. Go beyond it to a place of worship and surrender. See, our fundamental problem, and I'm saying this is a, a, a statement that is worth remembering, our fundamental problem is not the bad things that we have done, but the good things that we have put before God. So don't stop with those things. Don't stop at the star.